All right, welcome everybody. Let's um, just give it a minute here while folks trickle in, then we will get started. The screen share is still looking good. Yep, you're all good, Drew, and um, we'll just get going. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Local Motion Learning Network event. My name is Jonathan Weber. Uh, these he, him pronouns. I'm the Complete Streets Program Manager here at Local Motion. Um, if you don't know about Local Motion, our mission is to make biking and walking a way of life across Vermont. And that includes for both recreation and transportation purposes, which is uh, really what we're going to be talking about today. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm going to keep everyone muted uh, throughout the webinar, but please do type your questions and comments uh, into the chat, and I will field them to the panelists. Um, we have a few case studies that we're going to look at today, and we will take a few questions between each project um, as well as at the end of the webinar. So. Whenever you want to ask a question, just fire away, and uh, we will get to it. If you have any technical issues, um, you can send them directly to me through the question box in the chat, or you can email me at jonathan at localmotion.org. Um, this webinar is being recorded, so just be aware of that, and we will share the recording uh, in a follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow. There will also be some resources in that email, so keep an eye out for that. And let's get going. Um, Today's webinar, as I said, is really focused on this nexus of an interaction between recreation and transportation, the question of whether or not there is even a, a difference between recreation and transportation when you're talking about sort of walking and biking and, and active modes. Um, and I, you know, I think we're all pretty sold on the value of, of recreation and active transportation for our communities, um, whether that's because of you know, quality of life uh, or health, economic development, you know, resilience, sustainability. There's, there's a long list of uh, well-studied reasons to, to support these sorts of things. Um, of course, without the right infrastructure, you know, driving is often the only way to get to uh, what we think of as recreation facilities, um, which means that, first off, they're only accessible to people who have access to a car. So wouldn't it be great if, you know, people could exercise on their way to recreation or even recreate on their way to recreation? And, you know, how can our recreation facilities also better serve transportation purposes? This is a key question, um, really, right now, as facilities like rail trails are developed um, and linked together communities across Vermont. So this is really all about making the most out of recreation and transportation resources, um, the overlap between them, and making sure that the community gets the maximum benefit from the activity that those facilities attract. So in just a moment, we're going to be looking at these three different projects in Vermont that were focused on this nexus of transportation and recreation. Our panelists today are Drew Pollock-Bruce, Senior Recreation Planner with SE Group, Aidan Ickhoff, Analyst and Planner with SE Group, Sean Mealy, Transportation Designer with Stantec, and we'll also be hearing from folks from some of the communities involved in these projects, including Abby Long, who's the Executive Director of Kingdom Trails, and Lydia Petty, who's a Community Advocate in Northfield. So I'm gonna turn it over to our panelists who are gonna kick off our presentation with a look at the Missisquoi Valley Rail Trail, and an example of how the town of Enosburg is working to create better connections to the trail. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, again, I'm Drew, a senior recreation planner with, with SE Group. Um, so excited to be here with you all today. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, just a little bit of background on uh, what uh, what is this uh, idea of where does where does transportation end and recreation begin? Um, and as you see in the photo here, a lot of uh, uh, a familiar scene, uh, a busy trailhead here in Vermont. This one's actually from the Adirondacks because I had a great picture from the Adirondack Mountain Club I could find. Um, but it's a it's a common scene. And in many places in Vermont, uh, the trailhead is one of those primary destinations that folks are trying to get to. Um, and so having easy transportation to that uh, facility can be really helpful. Um, and particularly in uh, in these days of work from home, uh, it's, it's an experience for me. I used to bike commute uh, year year round here in Burlington, and I haven't been to the office in uh, over a year. And so I've started doing mental health commutes, is what I call them. But this morning I rode uh, a mile and a half on road, 
to, uh, to do three miles in the woods in Winooski um, at Memorial Park. And then I rode another mile and a half on the road back to my house. Um, and so was I transporting myself to that recreation or was I recreating on the way there? Uh, I enjoyed it a lot. So it was a beautiful morning. I enjoyed all of those pieces of it. Um, and so part of them um, was a transportation, maybe part of it was commute. Um, and it's hard to tell sometimes um, where those two things end. Um, and similarly in, in Vermont, um, it's really difficult to build a, a facility that's for transportation only. Um, if you think about those uh, shoulders that we put on rural roads, um, there's certainly a, a more transportation oriented facility, but you can have a lot of fun uh, riding along the Green Mountains. You know, think about um, all of those rides we like to do uh, uh, that, that are beautiful, but they're using that more transportation oriented network. Um, and so kind of no matter where we, we try to build our transportation facilities, they will have some recreation value um, almost anywhere in Vermont. Um, and then the kind of the last note there is that uh, active transportation is just really critical um, for folks throughout Vermont. It's become something that, that folks in every community almost are, are demanding. Uh, and so with that is the desire to get to everywhere, um, walking or biking, not, not, not just the shopping, but also to the local park, uh, to, to your trailhead, to your sports games, to all of those things. Um, and so active transportation, uh, relative to those recreation facilities um, becomes really important. Um, and so what we would like to explore with these three projects is where um, transportation planning or community planning overlaps with recreation planning or recreation projects. And we'll see this in Missiscoy and in Enosburg. Um, we'll see this in Kingdom Trails and in Northfield as well. Um, and so Often at a municipal or regional planning scale, a community plan might identify both of, both of these things. They might identify some transportation projects or some recreation projects. They're often funded very differently. Um, and so VTRANS or the local highway or road department might be working on some sorts of improvements like painting that shoulder, um, whereas the rec department or funding from FPR or um, VORAC or some of those other things could end up funding some of the other assets. And that's what we'll see throughout these projects uh, today is that uh, some of them were, were funded um, with, with transportation money and uh, are more transportation oriented projects. Uh, some of them are more recreation oriented and have that other kind of funding source. Um, but it's really the, the communities that make sure that it all kind of delivers exactly what the community wants because they often need both of those sorts of projects to achieve the visions um, that we, we see kind of coming out of community plans, um, downtown plans um, and, and comprehensive plans. And so it often comes to those local advocacy groups, local clubs, local residents who are involved in those planning processes to kind of talk about it during your, your municipal planning process. And then as these different projects uh, come online, make sure they don't lose sight of the other track. Um, because often our funding sources and our plans, after we get off kind of the big picture vision, they often are uh, separated um, into to two different tracks. And so it often uh, becomes the community members that have to make sure that both of those things are, are staying in, in, in focus. Um, and so first, um, I get to share a little bit about the Missiscoy Rail Trail. Um, and this one is really exciting. Uh, it, it's a project that builds off several initiatives uh, throughout the region um, in Franklin County. Um, uh, the Enosburg Vital Village Project, um, which is one uh, I was a project manager for that and this Missisquoi project. Um, the St. Albans Route 7 Livability Project that was uh, done by um, some other consultants in the state. There are many people who are good at this, uh, not just us here on the call. Um, and they uh, did a great, a great process around St. Albans, but also looked at the rail trail and how the community could connect to the Missisquoi Rail Trail. Uh, Rise Vermont up in Franklin County has done a lot of work programming for the rail trail and, and energizing folks, getting kids with helmets, um, the, the Regional Planning Commission. A lot of folks have touched on planning around the rail trail in, in different ways. And so when the Rail Trail project got its own project, um, it is a, a marketing and branding project. And, and the, the main thrust of this project was to increase the economic and tourism impact of the Missisquoi Valley Rail Trail through branding, wayfinding and signage, marketing and a trail-friendly business program. Um, and so this is a largely recreation-oriented project, but it had a lot of these 
um, uh, other projects that were more transportation oriented or downtown oriented that that was informing it and related to it. Um, and so, um, and this is one too where the rail trail does have some transportation value. I, I was really excited to hear uh, when we did some public engagement around it, we found uh, there are folks who do some park and ride uh, type of opportunity on the rail trail. So they live a bit more rural in Franklin County, but they would drive to Greens Corners, which is uh, I think about six miles outside of St. Albans or five miles outside the town, park and then ride their bike for that last five miles. And so it was too far to bike the entire way, but it allowed them to get that bike ride in as part of their commute. And, and it wasn't just one person, there was more than one person that was saying that they were doing this. And I thought that was a really kind of interesting and great overlap of the, the recreation and transportation. Um, with this project, there was a lot of community engagement. Uh, we did a, a rail trail roundup, which is one of the most fun public meetings I've ever had. We spent two days uh, riding down the rail trail and we had stops um, in all the towns along the way. Um, so that was some of the best two days of work I've, I've ever had. Um, but we did a lot of community engagement. Um, we ended up designing over 250 signs. Um, and so a, a lot of signs were designed through, through the project. Um, there are some signs out there today. And as you can see in the photos, they're getting a little bit uh, long in the tooth. Um, and so uh, some of them could need some cleaning up and some of them were actually still really good. Um, and so we wanted to build off some of the ones um, that, that were still really effective and were working um, and, and add some additional ones. So we came up with mile markers, trail directional signage, which we'll look at in a little bit more detail, etiquette signs, parking signs, and some town kiosks, as well as some on-road connection signs to connect uh, La Route Verte in Canada to the Missisquoi Rail Trail. It's only a few miles to the Canadian border and, and the, the Route Verte is right on the other side. Um, these are just some examples of the signs, the mile markers, um, and in the in the communities uh, in that each trailhead, there is uh, uh, the kiosk that you're seeing on the right side there. It identifies where businesses are. Um, it's kind of like the, the shopping district. It doesn't identify specific businesses by name or their location because they do change over uh, sometimes. Uh, and so the, the permanent signage kind of tells you uh, where the shopping is or where those services are relative to the trail in the downtown. And then there's a printed brochure that gives you the specific business name and location um, that can be updated by the Rail Trail Council every year um, as things change in, in the towns. Um, Another exciting part of the signage is these trail directional signs I had mentioned. Um, this rail trail has almost 50 road crossings and it's 26 miles. And so there are a lot of uh, off roads or off exit ramps, if you, if you will, um, off this rail trail. Um, and so this signage adds some of that information that we see uh, in a transportation system in our cars often. And so here you're able to see what is this road that I'm crossing? What is this exit that I'm on? Um, and what, what services might be available in, in either direction. And similarly, this one is not calling out businesses by name, um, but trying to say what types of services might be available in each, in each community. And here you're seeing a mock-up of what this sign would look like. And so it's very uh, bicycle oriented at that scale of pedestrians and bicyclists. It's added to the existing signage that's out there. So absolutely not trying to clutter uh, the visual uh, uh, um, seen on the trail, but you just add a little bit of that information and wayfinding for folks that are out there. Um, this aspect of the project really has no transportation uh, uh, aspect at all, but I really love it, so I wanted to share it with you all. Um, this is uh, rubbings that are placed at each of the town and trailhead kiosks, um, and then we developed a trail passport um, to go along with that that will be used by school groups and um, uh, uh, with other uh, uh, youth groups um, to encourage folks to go out and explore the trail. And so each of the, the kiosks has a rubbing um, and encourage you to, to take a rubbing at each uh, kiosk and then make some notes about observations along the trail. And it gives it this opportunity to kind of gamify the experience and get more folks um, out there and excited about, about being on the trail. Um, part of this uh, project redesigned the website, created the logo and a new brand, um, a new uh, trail brochure and trail map um, that will get started being distributed this summer. 
Um, and the uh, Rail Trail Council actually got 10,000 of these produced. And so we're hopeful that they'll be in every single uh, bike ride uh, pamphlet that you guys go on uh, this next summer. And you're seeing them uh, at, at the uh, hotels and at the rest stops. Um, develop some other marketing materials. I'm just gonna flash through because they're pretty to look at. I um, mean, kind of some social media materials with a, with a, with a hashtag branded explore the, the MBRT. Um, and, and here we come back to kind of how does this project relate to some of those other transportation projects? Um, here is the Enosburg Vital Village project. Um, as part of that, we got to use Local Motion's pop-up trailer um, for a really exciting pro uh, kind of demonstration project. Um, it was done in combination uh, with a public meeting, Enosburg Eats. Uh, so we did a walking tour and, and folks from the local community um, made uh, uh, food at all these different stops throughout downtown. It is by far, maybe not as fun as the rail trail roundup, but it was the best tasting and most delicious public meeting um, I've ever been to. Um, as we all know in Vermont, there's so much access to, to farm fresh food and every single stop was just incredible um, uh, with that. Um, but we, we did, um, we were able to do some spray chalk. We had local artists contribute to help us create those barn quilts. Um, we did some bump outs, um, uh, a local um, uh, uh, nursery donated the, the mums for the pop-up. And so we were able to kind of create um, uh, some enhancements in the downtown for the rail trail crossing um, and for some of the bump outs. Um, and it started to, to help the community explore connecting to the rail trail um, physically uh, through that project. Here, I'll turn it over to Sean to talk about a little, a little bit more about some other um, transportation aspects of that. Uh, sure. Yeah, the village project. I'm Sean from Stantec, and uh, we'll talk about some um, some things that we identified as part of the project process for um, improvements within the village of Enosburg Falls. Um, so we looked at order of magnitude uh, cost, um, how uh, you know what kind of logistic challenges um, would be included in pursuing some of these projects, and then some of the timelines, you know, in terms of short, medium, and longer terms, and also what um, what goals from the project um, are are being captured in some of these uh, pursuing some of these opportunities. So this picture here is looking um, north along Main Street in the village, and you can see an existing crosswalk where it's actually currently a pretty wide crossing, um, and so here. Here we're seeing a rendering that shows some um, a pretty significant bump out um, with some landscaping, some lighting, um, potential for stormwater improvement, um, as well as some uh, some streetscape um, improvements for um, placemaking, some uh, some seating and uh, and bike parking. Um, moving along, we've got. Um, one here uh, right in the middle of uh, town is Lincoln Park and so there's some opportunities there for creating more of a, a plaza feel um, for both you know some informal gathering and um, uh, around some local community events. Um, uh, looks uh, like some opportunities for um, expanding the uh, the landscaping along the grass strip um, as well as some more some more place making um, and just you know working on the vibrancy and uh, community engagement um, part of the project um, and uh, Moving along here, so we're looking along um, Depot Street, which has some some uh, areas with some uh, a lot of pavement. Um, we've got some access ways for some of the different um, local businesses and properties. And currently, there are some some more uh, crossings here, some crosswalks that are pretty long for pedestrians to cross that. And so there are certainly some opportunities for access management, um, for some traffic calming. Uh, for making some more uh, bump outs and uh, using some curbing and landscaping um, and uh, you know and and really helping to um, you know to to pr uh, support all users of of the facilities you know um, uh, pedestrians bicyclists as well as uh, you know local motor vehicle traffic um, so moving on I think we've got another slide here. So here we're looking at um, where the Missisquoi Trail actually crosses Main Street. 
Um, here we're looking on the corner of Depot and looking um, easterly um, down the trail. And so there are some improvements, um, not only for the the path itself, but you know, giving a place to to park some bikes and to have a seat and to um, look at some uh, local information, um, you know, that Drew was uh, was talking about earlier to, you know, give people some information to um, uh, encourage them to explore the town, you know, whether they're just stopping for um, a sandwich or a coffee or want to spend the afternoon, maybe check out some uh, community um, events going on. Um, you know, there's some nice opportunities here for that. Um, and then I believe the next slide is actually looking in the other direction um, at the at the same crossing. And, um, you know, here it's looking uh, at a different time of year. You know, there's certainly some opportunities in the winter time too. It's a popular trail that's used by a lot of snowmobilers. And so, you know, an, um, kind of a lower hanging fruit opportunity would be to provide a little um, uh, parking for snow machines, um, you know, in addition to uh, some, some seating and kiosk information. Um, um, you know, to encourage people to that are whether they're locals or um, you know on a longer journey um, to really uh, um, you know take a moment to stop in town and make them feel welcome and, and give them some uh, some helpful information for their visit. And I think uh, next slide, where are we? Oh yeah, I think it's back to Drew over here. That's awesome. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and I'll just talk again about kind of the overlap of these two projects where the Enosburg Vital Village project happened first um, and was envisioning, as we kind of saw, um, I'm going to go back a slide, um, um, envisioning some of these enhancements to the rail trail crossing, um, to where it crosses Main Street. And as we see some of the goals, it has bike ped and tourism and rec on there, um, uh, as well as some of the other ones. Um, and, and uh, through that project, they were able to envision the need for this. Um, the Missisquoi project got started in the middle of that Enosburg project. Um, and so the two kind of converged. Um, the Enosburg project was funded by a Stronger Communities Grant, which is through ACCD and VTrans. Um, and they gave a quick build um, the past two rounds. They've given a, a quick build grant. I think Northfield also got one that we'll see a little bit later. Um, and through that quick build funding, uh, Enosburg was actually able to implement the very first sign from the Missisquoi project. So the Missisquoi project uh, actually designed the panel of the sign, um, but the quick build funds uh, created the, the funding to, to print it um, on, on metal um, and to, to get the wood out there, to get landscaping and to actually implement that sign. And so that project, even midstream, neither projects were completely over and the sign was in the ground. Um, but both projects needed to kind of work together in order for that to happen. And so this is an improvement that, that serves both kind of transportation needs and recreation needs. Um, and it really came down to folks in the local community seeing those opportunities and, and working to connect those two um, as those two projects were, were going on. Um, really exciting too um, is that the Missisquoi Valley Rail Trail uh, was awarded a VORAC grant for 2020 to actually print and implement all of the rest of those 250 signs that we designed. And so that, that Missisquoi branding project had funding to design the signs, but not to implement all of them. Uh, but they were able to secure a VORAC grant uh, coming off of that project to implement all the signs along the Missisquoi. Um, COVID has kind of thrown a monkey wrench into that. It might have happened last year. I think the idea is that hopefully it will, they will all get into the ground and implemented uh, this year. Um, I think that will bring us to the end of our Missisquoi one, if there are any questions around it. Yeah, I've got uh, I've got a question for sure. So, I mean, it seems like Enosburg is like really lucky in the sense that the, the rail trail is it intersects so closely with the village's sort of commercial district. Um, was there any discussion about like a need to create any kind of on-road bike infrastructure? Or was it, or was the sense that it was more about you know people are already within walking distance, so we just sort of need to let them know that there's a village here and places to go. Well, and you hit the nail on the head. They are really lucky that Enosburg, unlike many of the communities on the Lamoille or some of the other ones, really it goes across Main Street on the block where all of the businesses are essentially. And so 
you couldn't almost be closer with the rail trail to the shopping district. And so thankfully they do have really nice, generous sidewalks along Main Street. And so it's, um, I don't know if you remember the exact width, but it's wider, it's, it's a downtown kind of width sidewalk facility. And we did talk about um, if there was need for bike lanes along Main Street through the project, I think the community was more interested and in, ended up with share roads along that Main Street section, but there is a lot of traffic calming as well. And so I think those, those elements together were kind of envisioned um, as, as some of that enhancement, but it's partially because it's, it's literally on that block. And so was it valuable to paint the, the cross or the, the bike lanes for the block or two? I would say maybe yes, it would, stood, would be, but the, the community was uh, found that, that Sheryls were probably the right way to go. And I think particularly because it was so close. And that's the same with, the, with snowmobiles. There are very few areas of the Bass Trail that are right across Main Street and downtown like that. And so Enosburg was really fortunate to be able to, to leverage that. Um, Interestingly, too, they have a uh, their high school and elementary school are right there in downtown, a couple blocks from this too. So Enosburg is really fortunate in kind of the density they have for such a small village. Yeah, was was parking management and like bathroom facility access considered part of this project? Absolutely, um, parking. Uh, I'll go back a couple slides. Um, it's hard to see. Um, but this does say village parking on this sign in the rendering. And there is a big lot next to their um, opera house that is a public uh, civic parking lot. And um, the idea is kind of that uh, park once, um, and they're trying to drive a lot of the parking to this parking lot for both the rail trail and downtown. Um, it doesn't have signage now. It has, I think, three curb cuts onto the road for it, which it probably didn't need shot in that parking lot. Um, no curbing at all. Um, and so that parking lot can use some enhancement, but it's available now. People just don't know it's there. Um, it does have that one sign off Main Street down Depot Street it says parking down Depot Street. But once you got here, you didn't know that that was even a public parking lot necessarily. Um, and so really trying to daylight a lot of that. Um, one of the other recommendations is for a welcome center uh, for the village. Um, and it, uh, they do have a historical, um, uh, 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 historic society museum that's open um, uh, usually one day on the weekend, but they're thinking about trying to open it for both days on the weekend and make that bathroom space available. Um, it's really cool because it's in the old train station and then they have a, a train car on the rail trail that you can get in um, and check it out as part of that. Um, and so they're trying to make the public restrooms available through that welcome center. Um, primarily on the weekends, but that is absolutely a, a, a conversation that they're having. Great. Thanks, Art. Let's keep it rolling and um, turn our attention to Kingdom Trails. I'll turn it over to Abby. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, my name is Abby Long. I'm the executive director for Kingdom Trails. Um, we are a nonprofit trail network located up in Vermont's stunning Northeast Kingdom. Um, however, we are a trail system deeply entwined with our local community. Um, it was our own community members who banded together to develop our 100 plus miles of multi-use trails in, in uh, 1994. So, so we're celebrating 27 years now. Um, and now we have over 100 private landowners who allow trails to cross their properties. Um, and we're so proud that the trail user experience extends beyond our network, really to the community fabric and tourism infrastructure that surrounds it. Um, users drive and ride along our local roads and visit lodging and restaurants and the cute country stores, um, and they fill the village parking areas. Um, <laughs> and of course, I'm, I'm super biased, but Kingdom Trails has become one of the most popular trail networks um, destinations. Uh, again, I said I'm biased, but it's in the country <laughs> and um, with well over 100,000 visits per year. Um, this is pre-pandemic, of course, but in 2019, we experienced 135,000 visits, which is a 132% increase from 2013. So a lot of growth, and that is a lot of people. Um, and yes, KT generates tremendous economic impact throughout the region, um, about $10 million annually. 
and is a remarkable recreation resource for folks. However, um, Kingdom Trails wholeheartedly acknowledges that this level of use places pressure on the rural village infrastructure, um, our neighbors, and most importantly, the private landowners who make our trails possible. Um, so we needed to do something uh, to address these issues. Uh, Kingdom Trails, in conjunction with our local chamber, uh, applied for and received a huge USDA Rural Business Development Grant to help fund a Kingdom Trails Network capacity study. And uh, these funds uh, were uh, truly fortunate through them to uh, retain the services of SE Group. Uh, Drew and I became best friends <laughs> as this study would provide a better understanding of the capacity of the trail network, the needed supportive infrastructure, strategies to address the growing number of users and imbalances throughout the system, plus improving the quality of life in the region. Um, this study would also explore a new welcome center location, uh, access portal improvements, connections and crossings, um, and an opportunity to disperse our users throughout the system. Um, so that's a little bit of the background. And, and with that, I'm going to throw it over to Drew to give you the nitty gritty details. Yeah, thank you very much, Abby. I was um, probably the the happiest day I ever had at work when I found out we got this project in the door. I have to say, I was really glad uh, to get this one and to be able to have so many site visits at Kingdom Trails. Uh, you, you did not have to twist my arm to, to set up trail counters in, on that one. Um, so I had a lot of fun working on that. And, and, and really your staff is just so incredible to work with. So it was, it was a great project. Um, as Abby mentioned, uh, this project tried to look at all those different components of the town. It's not just the trail system, but the roads, the parking, um, the community uh, assets, the uh, businesses, um, all those things and how they work together to kind of deliver the experience for both locals and for visitors um, in, in East Burke and, and kind of throughout the local region. Um, so we looked at quality of life, we looked at experience, we looked at economics, and we looked at capacity of, this, of the system um, and tried to find ways um, to enhance access, safety, the experience, and, and the economics and disperse some of that use and economics throughout the system. Um, we did a lot of public engagement uh, in February, uh, right before we all kind of knew we were we had to stop these sorts of things. We had a giant uh, open house. Uh, we had over 200 people come. It was, it was uh, a huge meeting. Um, so we got a lot of local folks. I know there's even some people in February who had driven up from Boston and a few other places because they were that passionate um, about it. But we also got a lot of information from those visitors through the survey where we got almost a thousand responses. Um, a lot from right in Burke and in Northeast Kingdom, but also kind of throughout the country, uh, throughout the world, in fact, in some places. Um, so we got a lot of feedback through that. Um, and a lot of lots of community engagement um, with kind of smaller focus group meetings. Um, and we also um, did some, it was gonna be intercept surveys, um, but we, uh, with COVID, we couldn't be out there asking people to stop along the trails. And so we, we did a, a post ride survey online um, but I should note, uh, uh, Enosburg uh, was able to do intercept surveys in 2019, um, utilizing the local stats class at the high school. Um, so they were the ones uh, doing the intercept and it was really helpful for them to learn about sample size um, and some of those aspects, but also the time it takes for consultants to do that work was not gonna allow it to happen um, uh, uh, effectively. And so those two things coming together on that one made it, made it really nice. Um, with the capacity analysis at Kingdom Trails, it's a large system, as Abby mentioned, over 100 landowners and, and lots of miles of trail. Um, so we divided the system up into seven different, what we call pods, but these are just distinct riding areas, you might think of them, um, that have their own parking and, and infrastructure to them. Um, for sure at Kingdom Trails, like the uh, ability to go all the way across the system is one of the most exciting things. So a lot of people, do move between one pod or another or park in one and ride to another. But the analysis tried to break up the system to understand what is the parking and capacity relative uh, uh, to that pod and then how do those things work together uh, for the whole system. Um, on our website, uh, Kingdom Trail, or on Kingdom Trail's website uh, with our project website, uh, back, backslash network capacity, you can get all of this information in detail 
but we did uh, do some capacity analysis on each pod, as well as make some pretty detailed recommendations um, on kind of a pod by pod basis, um, increasing parking or trail access, uh, connectivity, uh, food and beverage or lodging. And so for each area of Kingdom Trails, there's a lot of detailed recommendations um, to kind of help guide long-term decision-making. What should our priorities be? Or particularly, um, as many of you know, we're working on trails. It's somewhat opportunistic with private landowners. If a private landowner comes to you, um, that becomes an opportunity, but it helps to have this backdrop of uh, what is our overall vision? So when somebody does come to you, you know how that all, all fits in. Um, and so this tries to help um, inform some of that, that thinking for uh, Kingdom Trails. There are lots of other recommendations that are uh, touch on trail access. Some of them are infrastructure related. Some of them are messaging related, um, like apps or uh, uh, um, uh, meetings even. There's a lot of kind of community meetings and landowner meetings and engagement. So lots of different strategies um, to help kind of disperse the use, uh, relieve pressure on the landowners, um, kind of create that safer uh, and less congested biking and walking and driving. Um, and other enhancements. Um, I think though, um, kind of thinking about the overlap of recreation and transportation in this project, I think I described it earlier as a recreation problem with a transportation solution. Um, and so uh, there is very much a recreational system, Kingdom Trails, but its issues um, were largely transportation related. So having a better, um, having a better uh, 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 shuttle to get folks around um, was actually in the works even before our project started to enhance that with a grant from uh, uh, Rural Community Transit. And I think it was, uh, it was also a VTrans grant that they got, but maybe Sean, you, you know that, you can chime in with that. Um, but that was already kind of in the works already. But also just getting a crosswalk in the center of East Burke was identified as one of those things that would make a big difference in the ease of people using this recreational system, but also kind of getting through downtown in cars. Um, so I think here we'll focus on uh, some of the top three recommendations um, that kind of came out of the study, but just know that there are lots more, um, including this one you're kind of seeing on the screen, which I like, uh, mobile welcome center units in the parking lots. Um, so you can sign your waiver and get your information right there in the, uh, in the lot. Um, but we'll focus on these top three you can go to our website and see some of the others if you're interested. Um, and with that, um, oh, I was gonna take this one on road, road trail crossing. So I'll do the first big one and then I'll turn it over to Sean. Um, Kingdom Trails has something uh, over 40 road trail crossings. It's a big system with a lot of private land. And so unlike most mountain bike systems that get access to one parcel and you develop a lot of trail on that state forest or you know out west often it's national forest or BLM, this one is crosses roads, it crosses farms, it crosses lots of people's backyards. And so it has a different orientation than many mountain bike systems. And so there are many road trail crossings throughout the system. And we identified the opportunity to, to apply some standardized treatment to each of those crossings um, to, to, to make some enhancements. Um, so same text, but a different image there is just showing uh, this is, uh, Darling Ridge Road, um, and I believe if you're familiar with the trail system, uh, that's vast on one side and border on the other, if I remember my trail names correctly. Um, and so uh, what you're seeing here is a, uh, what we're calling a tactile rumble strip, and that would be more, I think, the transportation parlance, but if you're a mountain biker, you might think of it as a rock garden. Um, and so this is just some rocks along the trail that give you a little bit of a uh, bump. Um, and it's a visual and sensory cue uh, to kind of signal bikers to, to not uh, to slow down as they approach that crossing. Um, it also helps prevent erosion and armor the trail right there where it meets pavement, um, which is helpful. Um, and then it also integrates um, all the signage into one vertical element. And so Kingdom Trails has kind of almost, I'd say, best in, uh, best in the country uh, signage for evacuation signage. They have a really developed system for identifying um, if injuries happen on the trail, uh, where that happens and how to get folks out. And so at every road trail crossing, there's signage uh, for an evacuation point. Um, there's stop signage on the trails. Um, there's also a need for some uh, uh, mapping or wayfinding signage. One of the problems is that um, a lot of folks end up uh, trying to figure out where they are and uh, often would read maps more in the road um, than off the road. And so by placing a map that's not quite 
it doesn't have any seating. It's not at, you know encouraging you to stop and spend a lot of time there. But if you are going to stop, it kind of encourages you to stop and think about your your next move off the roadway instead of in the roadway. Um, so having that 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 simple map there um, and integrating all those other kind of signage that they have at the crossings into one post um, kind of helps helps um, create that that one signage for that and also a vertical element to signal drivers that you might be approaching um, a trail crossing. Um, and so um, that's one of those key projects and I'll turn it over to Sean now to talk about two of the others. Sure. So um, before I, I speak to this slide, I will uh, speak to what Drew was referring to with that um, shuttle, uh, which is being um, uh, being picked up by the Regional Commuter Transportation Group, RCT, um, with 90% uh, funding provided through a congestion mitigation and air quality improvement grant, CMAC, um, pursued through VTRANS, uh, which will include 10% local matching funds uh, split between Kingdom Trails, Burke Mountain, and the towns of Burke, Lindenville, Kirby, and East Haven. Um, that grant has a three-year term after which VTRANS will uh, transfer it to a federal 5311 uh, rural public transportation grant um, as long as ridership is su sufficient. Um, and uh, at that time, um, that will require a 50% local match, which is anticipated to come uh, from a combination of uh, town appropriations, uh, donations, and sponsorship advertising. Um, and, so, and you know what, Sean, we didn't explicitly talk about this beforehand, but that shuttle is actually an interesting overlap of recreational use and transportational use, too. I wonder if you want to touch on that, too. I didn't. Yeah, that's a great call. Um, so, you know, it, it will be a shuttle that will be open to anybody that wants to use it, whether they're a mountain biker or not. Um, and so it'll serve uh, the community and it will also have a, a bike trailer on there for, um, for riders to load up their bikes on and um, it'll have a few stops. Um, and so it'll, you know, it'll help to support um, you know, that combination of um, kind of a hybrid model of um, part, you know, some larger parking areas, some smaller parking areas, and, you know, some ways to travel um, between the pods, uh, making making use of that shuttle. Um, so that was, that was a, you know, a pretty cool part of the project. Um, here on this slide, we're looking at a figure um, showing um, the village area of East Burke, and we've got uh, Vermont uh, Route 114 going through the middle of it. Um, and, uh, over on the right, on the left-hand side, sorry, we've got um, Burt Callow Road and um, East Darling Hill Road, and um, I will I will mention that um, little intersection that uh, Drew's cursor on uh, now between um, East Darling Hill Road and Burt Callow is currently a um, an intersection that has one stop. Um, uh, one stop control on the approach um, coming um, kind of the, the northeasterly approach there, but that intersection is being reconfigured as part of a construction project that I believe is taking place this season that will involve uh, full depth reconstruction and widening of the length of East Darling Hill Road, which will include adding a um, a, uh, an uphill uh, bike lane um, and some sharrows for downhill riders. And then at this intersection, it includes uh, realigning the intersection to be more perpendicular and it will actually be a three-way stop controlled intersection. Um, so that will uh, support um, more comfort as well as safety of um, not just motor vehicles, but of course, um, mountain bikers and pedestrians. Um, uh, on the left of that intersection, you see um, a popular trailhead um, now, and that also has some some opportunities for um, some improvements, um, including a um, and and uh, Drew and Abby, you can jump in on me if I if I'm not uh, speaking to it, but including a, a mountain bike roundabout um, potentially um, with some area for um, kind of you know, helping riders to kind of slow down before they get to the road, um, give a little spot to um, to gather, you know, get your group in order, um, and uh, and maybe look at um, 
you know, some information uh, before you get to the road crossing itself. Um, so back to kind of what's going on in the middle of the village here, we've got Vermont 114. Um, right now, the, the most popular area to park or the largest um, parking area is just south of this figure at uh, Mike's Tiki Bar. Um, you know, they can, in, uh, they can accommodate over 150, I think 175 or so vehicles now. Um, Mike would love to get as many vehicles as, as possible in there. Um, and, you know, and it's a great place. And then so what happens is, you know, people park there and then they'll make their way across 114, um, either by Belden Hill Road on the right there, which includes an intersection, you know, with 114, where you kind of got to pop out a bit to really see oncoming traffic on your right um, with the uh, the bridge, um, the bridge right there over Dishmill Brook, um, um, or uh, getting to 114 through a little um, existing um, uh, paved path on the other side of the building there. And so from there, an existing desire line goes through the parking lot. Um, uh, on the other side of the road, um, that's the parking lot for the bike shop in town, East Burke Sports, and then can connect to some existing um, dirt trails to either go kind of north of there to, to a small pod or to bring it back to um, uh, Burke Hollow Road to get to that trail pod. Um, that that trail that trailhead uh, over here on the left. And so currently to get to um, to get to that uh, that trailhead, you know, it is a shared um, bridge here, uh, a narrow bridge that's a, a motor vehicle bridge, two lane, um, and uh, so it is, you know, it is a bit uh, tight in there. And so there's a few opportunities that we're showing on this figure. Um, one is a potential pedestrian bridge, which would separate um, bicycles and pedestrians uh, from the roadway as they're crossing the Pasumpsic River there, and then connect to um, um, uh, some crossings at the uh, at the upcoming new intersection there, um, and then in the middle. Um uh, before I kind of talk about the connections between them, um, we're showing a potential crosswalk. So currently there is no formal marked crosswalk um, in the village. And uh, this location here um, uh, appears to be a good location for a crosswalk, which um, would uh, meet the requirements um, for mid-block crossings per the VTRANS guidelines for pedestrian crossing treatments. Um, based on its location, based on its uh, usage of um, vehicles, based on uh, motor vehicle volumes, uh, speeds, and uh, vicinity um, away from any other crosswalks, as well as um, a little, a little uh, distance from on-road parking. So there is currently on-road parking along the south side of um, Vermont 114 there in front of some of the local businesses. Um, and so it's recognizing that desire line that, you know, that we were discussing that go, that typically goes through that parking lot of the bike shop. And, you know, in discussion with, um, with the bike shop owners, um, you know, they're supportive of a shared use path that would go on the other side of their sh shop. Um, that could connect to a, um, a potential crosswalk there and then um, connect to an improved um, shared use path along the river, you know, which would be great for uh, making those connections, off-road connections um, between the village and some of the trailheads, as well as uh, serving the community as a nice um, river walk there. Um, uh, we're not showing currently any uh, path connections on the south side, but that is something that would be explored during um, the next steps, you know, in, in going after these projects. So the next step would be scoping. And so during that scoping process, um, the, the landowners could be engaged and uh, some opportunities for shared use path, um, you know, could be explored that could, um, you know, connect directly to that larger parking area on the south side of the road. Um, and so, let's see. Um, so you know there's there's some great opportunities here um and so as part of this project you know these opportunities were identified as well as um some of the steps to to um to pursue them between um completing scoping studies for them and then um you know moving on to um you know conceptual engineering plans refining cost estimates um and uh, securing funding for um 
for final uh, engineering and uh, construction here, we're looking um, uh, we're looking easterly on Route 114. Um, we're in the village on the left hand side. You can see the Orange Rind Restaurant and the Eastburg Sports um, uh, Bike Shop there. And um, on the right, you can see some uh, a picnic area, a picnic table, and existing kiosk. Um, and you can see a sign for pedestrian crossing, a warning sign, but as you can see, there's no uh, formal marked um, crosswalk here. Um, so our next slide shows um, some rem renderings of, of what that would look like. Oh, back up, there we go. Um, so here, you know, we see a location for the, for the crosswalk, um, as well as a path connection um, and some signage, um, you know, for helping uh, with some, um, uh, some navigating in town and then some improvements to the kiosk. Um, so that's a, a nice opportunity um, that came out of this. Um, I was just gonna chime in there for a moment, Sean, because I wanted to mention um, for folks that haven't been to Kingdom Trails, if you've been, you know this probably already, but right now folks are kind of, usually there's a lot of cars parked here along the road and folks are just darting through almost anywhere. And so there's a lot of crossings on the road. And as a driver, you just don't know wh where they're gonna cross because um, there's no formal place. And so a lot of folks are crossing um, everywhere. So, just so if, if, you're, if you've been there, you know, but if you haven't, uh, just that little bit of background. And then yeah. also that, this town had studied a crosswalk here before um, in the center of Eastburg Village, and they were looking at it um, a little bit further east um, in front of the country store. Um, and as you can see in this photo, I feel like Sean found a needle in the haystack with this location um, because where it is kind of maintains uh, that, that parking. You actually can, by I think policy Sean has identified, you can actually on-road park in this section as well. Um, but most people don't. When it necks down, that's where most of the parking started. But the crosswalk was shut down locally uh, because they didn't want to lose that parking in front of the country store. And it was one of those things where there's so much demand for parking in the village. That one spot was where it was the local spot to grab milk, that, that one spot that it had to be given up. Um, and so while people recognized it was a huge need, I think there was some challenge in having, unfortunately, we often hear that giving up parking was a challenge. Um, some cases you can get them to say, well, we need to get rid of the parking. But in this case, I think Sean did find a spot um, and that was really a magic thing uh, to be able to find that spot that maintained some of that parking and, and created that um, really needed uh, opportunity for a crosswalk. And Drew did bring up a great point about, you know, the the crowds, you know, this, this picture here is, is a, pretty quiet day but um as abby can attest to you know on on some of the uh the bigger um event weekends and, and more popular days you know uh it, you get a lot of congestion you know you get a lot of traffic um both motor vehicles parking for motor vehicles is is challenging and um and you know then crossing safely for so many pedestrians and, and cyclists um you know it, it creates um creates some issues mm -hmm. I think I took this photo with nobody in it. It was a weekday during COVID time. Like that, you would never see Kingdom Trails look like this when they're open usually with, with not a person on this image. Um, so it's not typical to see that. Usually it looks a lot more like that. <laughs> so here we're seeing, um, you know, uh, another, another big part of the study was, um, identifying a location for a new uh, welcome center, a Kingdom Trails and East Burke Welcome Center. And the project team looked at several locations, both within the village area and pretty far outside of the village area. And this location here uh, is the one that really rose to the top. Um, it makes use of an existing uh, parcel that's that's currently owned by Kingdom Trails um, that's located um, behind some of the businesses and, and properties along 114 there, um, you know, right right near the um, the action in, in the in the village area there. And um, so they currently have some easements for vehicular access um, by way of a driveway um, through um, uh, property owned by a local church um, 
and so that would be something that would be, um, you know, addressed in the in the next phases there. Um, uh, you know, the work would also include some um, improvements to a segment of sidewalk along 114 that was skipped over in a previous project for sidewalk improvements that is adjacent to a um, uh, an existing uh, retaining wall that would need um, need to be addressed as well. Um, and so, you know, you can also see on the left-hand side of this figure, some of those um, paths that we were talking about earlier, um, you know, both a proposed multi-use path um, from 114, as well as connecting to and, and um, maybe improving some of the existing uh, paths there. Um, and so, you know, the um, the Welcome Center would include, of course, um, you know, both indoor and outdoor amenities. It would include, you know, uh, space for offices, indoor programming, um, potentially, um, uh, you know, uh, some retail space, um, as well as changing areas, you know, bathrooms and whatnot, facilities like that. And then outdoors, um, you know, uh, picnic areas, um, space for outdoor programming, um, some uh, stations for bike repair, bike washing, um, as well as uh, um, parking for bikes and um, a large area for, for motor vehicle parking. And, and that's something that could be pursued um, in, in stages, in phases. You know, it doesn't have to be completely built out, um, you know, at the beginning or at the get-go. And um, you know, and that provides a lot of opportunities. You know, Mike's Tiki Bar is going to be there for a long time. It's going to be a big draw, but this gives another um, parking area right in the village. And actually, you know, for some people, maybe families that want to be able to park and access some of the um, family friendly um, uh, trails just north of here, um, you know, where you can park and not have to cross 114 um, and, and get a little bit different experience there. Um, you know, this, this looks like it's really going to be a good spot for that. Um, I think, Sean, it's worth noting too that right now Kingdom Trails doesn't control any of the parking associated with the system. They have private landowners and partners that are providing a lot of that parking. And so this will give Kingdom Trails the opportunity to have some control over some of that parking. Um, but it's important to kind of think about that's how this system has come together. And it's very different than some of the ones we see out west or in other states. And that's more of how, how it has to happen often in Vermont, where where um, more than one entity is getting together to help deliver these things. Sure, sure. Um, and, you know, and so to pursue that welcome center that, you know, would, would um, be a, um, a master planning process, you know, specific to that welcome center to, to move that forward to pursue. And I think here, uh, pass it back to Abby. Sure. Yeah, so as Drew and Sean just shared, uh, the East Burke Village Cross Rock and the Safe Road and Trail Crossings and the new Welcome Center were identified as highest community priorities, as you can see in Drew's fancy smanshi uh, graph. Um, and KT totally agrees, and, and we're already taking action. Um, and this capacity study was literally wrapped up like, what, three weeks ago? And um, I, we're already underway writing multiple grants for funding to implement the needed infrastructure. Um, and actually I just found out on Monday, very exciting, I got full funding uh, to implement the safe road and trail crossing project. So that will come to light by the end of this summer. Um, and we're working with the town of Burke Select Board to pursue a scoping study for the crosswalk. Um, and we went above and beyond the recommendations from the SE group actually. And the Burke Mountain, Kingdom Trails and the town of Burke um, have purchased flashing uh, speed signs at the north and south of town. They'll be placed. So when you come into town in your car, you will be demanded to slow down. Um, <laughs> so that was another good uh, joint effort by our community. Um, but the biggest and of course most daunting yet inspiring project our community identified will be the Welcome Center. Uh, Kingdom Trails is excited to tackle this endeavor as it will not only be KT's Welcome Center, but also a community hub for all. Uh, it will be a place to greet and educate our visitors, provide office space, um, house local programming and events, parking, parking, parking. Um, I'll finally even have parking for my own staff. We currently don't have that. Um, and of course, safe access to trails and businesses. Um, so 
this new welcome center will serve as a, a portal and an accessible center for the entire Northeast Kingdom is, is really our, our vision. Um, and we understand that these projects and improvements won't happen overnight, uh, yet with our community's patience and understanding and our, and our trail users' patience and understanding, uh, KT will strive to make the most responsible and of course sustainable decisions uh, based on everyone's input. Um, and we've, we have been committing to our community that we'll continue to consistently keep folks informed every step of the way, of course. Um, and, and I love, Katie loves sharing um, our journey through the capacity study, as I am right now, uh, in hopes that other communities and other trail networks will, will learn and look to it um, as a resource, truly. Um, if I could go back those 27 years in 1994, I would make sure that the supporting infrastructure uh, was being built alongside the trail network. Um, so I just wanna end with, uh, to extend a heartfelt and sincere thank you to, to everyone who was involved, uh, especially the SC group and Stantec, um, but of course, to the folks who make it possible, our KT landowners. Hey, Abby, can you share a little bit about the grant that you got for the road trail crossings? Because I think it was kind of more of a recreational oriented grant um, but it's funding this improvement that will have kind of this great transportational improvement as well for, for motorists, for people on the trail. Um, what was the, uh, the name of the grant? Could you share? Northern Forest um, Destination Development Outdoor Recreation Program. Um, and it actually, I wrote the grant to not only be the safe road and trail crossing um, project, but it was going to be paired with our expanded ambassador program. So we'll actually have Kingdom Trails employees out on the network, um, more of them, because we do have an ambassador program. So we'll have, we'll be able to hire more to hold trail users accountable to make sure that they are being safe and behaving well um, and respectful to our landowners. That's amazing, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you so much to Drew and Abby and, and Sean for that one. Um, I have a little bit of a tough question. I'm still kind of trying to formulate, but I, I think, you know, a lot of, there, there are a lot of places that are feeling a little bit of sort of the pressure from like, you know, whether it's a tourism destination in their community or, you know, a, a recreation destination, whatever it is, um, and they maybe don't have the supporting infrastructure in place. Um, how, how should community like, <laughs> gather the momentum to sort of start this kind of process of figuring out what the supporting infrastructure needs are um, without <laughs> letting it get to the point where there's a real problem. You know, I don't know if there's an answer to that, but I, I would love any thoughts you have on that. Um, I think, I don't know, I think I have an answer <laughs> officially, but um, I feel like Every other week, someone emails me from somewhere in the country saying, we want to be like KT. We want to make KT in our community. Um, and, and that, just as I just shared, um, you know, if I could go back those 27 years, I'd make sure that we had the proper infrastructure to go along with it. Um, so, so I just, I, I think the, yeah, like I said, I don't think I have an actual answer. And, and I don't know if there is one. Um, you know, through the capacity study, we found that our trails were fine with capacity. The num they are able to accept the 100,000 users that we see each year. It's with, it's what we don't have is the parking. The community wasn't able to host that amount of people. So I, I think a community just needs to come together and communicate and collaborate, um, all stakeholders, and really envision what they want their home to look like and how, how many people can they accept sustainably and, um, and, and build based off that vision, that agreed upon vision. I don't know, Drew, you're the expert. I, I agree with that. I feel like there isn't a great answer for that, unfortunately, Jonathan. And, and I would, cause I would say, I would echo what Abby said that a lot of towns, when you talk about recreational tourism in Vermont right here, like we want it to be like Kingdom Trails. Like I have also heard that many times. Um, and in some respects, you can't be like Kingdom Trails. They were so successful. It's so hard. To, like the the pace of success that Kingdom Trails was able to achieve, no community can keep up with that. It it takes many years to work through a V-Trans process. Kingdom Trails was so successful. 
it's hard for a community process to stay aligned with that. Um, but it's unlikely that most places will be as successful as Kingdom Trails. It is one of those outliers that is just incredibly successful or successful or popular or um, desirable, if you want to think of it in that way. Um, but I do think being aware that that can be an issue is your number one thing. And then trying to pace your growth um, to say like, maybe we shouldn't be um, as um, kind of, at, uh, at, we, should, we should meter our growth a little bit more so we can make sure that those things that take a little bit longer maybe um, often, often do. But I think it was kind of a, a firestorm because kind of as I had said out, out West, the trail systems are developed on public lands. And so they have the same kind of timeline that other public projects have. They take many years to develop. Um, whereas Kingdom Trails on, pub, on private lands was able to, to do things a little bit differently um, and kind of be a little bit of a faster pace than a sidewalk project or a, a public project. Um, and so I think just being aware of that potential um, is really important, but also to know that it's unlikely, unfortunately, that every town in Vermont can't be East Burke and Kingdom Trails. And it, you know, it's, it's unlikely that, that you will achieve uh, 100,000 visitors to your trail system um, you know, um, immediately. Yeah, thanks. Nick, Nick Benat from Vimba asks, any suggestions for much smaller trail systems as they consider, or um, you know, how best to consider capacity as those smaller trail systems grow and sort of where to begin? So I think I think you got into that I think in that answer that you just gave Drew and, and Abby both. But if you have any other thoughts, uh, parking, parking, parking. If you're talking about capacity, it comes down to your parking and access number. And to the extent that you can create access that doesn't require parking, and that's a lot of what we're kind of talking about today. Um, those places where you can access Kingdom Trails without having to drive is there's no problems with that. The trails could handle could handle that all day long and, and you know, 200,000 people more probably if there was no need to move them from parking lot to the middle of the trail system. Um, and so um, focusing on parking and making sure your parking capacity is dialed in is, is, is one way to really make sure you're staying up on top of that as, as it grows. And I think, you know, I'm a mountain biker. I, I live in Chittenden and if you're one of them like me, you might see Saxon Hill. Um, where I thought that when they built that new parking lot two years ago, I was like, this will be, this is huge. This is going to be great. Um, and if you've been there this year, it, it's been full often. Um, and so just trying to, to stay on top of parking capacity as much as possible will, will help you a lot. Yeah, I think, you know, King, Kingdom is exceptional. You know, I almost asked like, you know, you know, why not build out more like on-road infrastructure so that, you know, locals can, can get to the trails. But and KT is exceptional because a lot of the locals have the trails right in their backyard. So why would they get on the road when they could just, you know, ride through the backyard and be on the trails? But I think in other places where there isn't the same level of land access and trail development, it is important for those to consider those to consider on-road infrastructure as a solution to reduce demand for parking, so that folks who live nearby don't have to drive, you know, two miles or whatever, just so that they can get out of their car and get back on their bike. Let's let's let them ride from their house. Big strategy for the Mad River Valley, for example, is much more than that, because they don't have quite the expansive system that Kingdom Trails has in terms of connectivity. Um, exactly. Yeah, I think, you know, that's not just a mountain biking thing, right? It's also, I think, something for these these communities on the rail trails to really look at, um, how can we make sure that our, our residents can get there easily and not have to drive. Great, thank you for that. Let's, uh, let's move on to hear from um, Aiden and Lydia about uh, Northfield. Hi everyone, thank you, Jonathan. Um, as he said, my name is Aiden Eikhoff. I'm with SC Group and I'm joined here today by um, two of the members uh, really helped me out on the planning team. One, Lydia Petty, who was the co-chair um, of the steering committee and then Sean Neely from Stantec. Um, so the Northfield Ridge and River Roots Master Plan um, was funded through a Better Connections program uh, through the Commerce of Community Development and the NV Trans. Um, SC Group completed this project as the primary consultant along with uh, Santec, Watershed, and um, Kamoin Associates. Um, this project was started 
in November 2019 and ended in uh, January 2021. So a little over a year. Um, and part of that was pandemic pushing the timeline a little bit. Uh, next slide. Um, so it, I would be remiss to start talking about our planning project as if it didn't happen uh, on the tail of a lot of other great community work uh, in Northfield. So um, Lydia specifically was a part of many of these um, studies and pedestrian experience surveys um, that were completed in Northfield. So these were audits and observations that included information about um, existing facilities, um, existing pedestrian facilities, as well as places where pedestrians were going and were walking that didn't actually have sidewalks. Um, it also included an audit of um, sidewalks that had large accessibility issues, such as a telephone pole built right in the middle of about a four foot sidewalk. Um, uh, specifically, yeah, the Northfield Walk Audit, as well as the South Main Street pedestrian experience were really, really helpful to start our project and also demonstrate the need for the Better Connections grant. Next slide. Um, this is a pretty rough outline of the study area. So Northfield is much, much bigger than what is shown um, in this orange box, but the, the population core um, is captured within this area. So up at the top of the box, you have Northfield Falls, and then moving south, you have the village area, and what we call Northfield Center is sort of where the energy and facilities of Norwich University are. And then it moves down to sort South Northfield. Um, that kind of green blob you see is the town forest. Um, and we will talk about that in a second. Next slide. Um, so this, uh, this planning project kicked off sort of as everything does with an existing conditions analysis and a primary roadway analysis. Um, that primary roadway analysis is required through the VTRANS grant, but it's also um, really, really important in this planning project uh, because as you may have seen in the earlier map, um, Route 12 is the only road that connects these three population centers together. Um, and that is shown in the picture on the left here, um, Northfield Falls, there is no sidewalks, uh, limited to no pedestrian infrastructure. Um, and to the west, you have the Falls General Store, and to the east, you have the post office. So two places that community members would absolutely be walking uh, between um, parking at one, going to the other, something like that. And there's just nothing to support it. Um, in the middle picture, you just see, you know, some asphalt sidewalks that have seen better days. And then on the right, that's that's a, one of the main trailheads in Northfield. Um, so sort of the road ends and the trail starts. Um, there's no information. Um, that might have changed, Lydia, but <laughs> upon the time of this photo, um, limited information and really, really informal access points. So. Um, there's about one to three car spaces there. It's not clear that you're allowed to park there. Right outside of the frame of this photo is a house that feels like you're kind of parking in their front yard. Um, so just very informal access. You sort of have to be in the know um, to get to. And it's also up a fairly steep hill. So it's, it's not as um, walkable for the entire community, but it is pretty close. Northfield's really lucky um, their town forest is very close to their downtown center. So strengthening those connections was a big part of our project. Um, next slide. Um, so I'm going to go through three little mini case studies from some of our recommendations of the plan that identify how we, um, through our existing conditions analysis, connected the um, population centers and the uh, service centers of Northfield to their wonderful, wonderful recreation uh, assets um, that they've worked really, really hard to develop after Tropical Storm Irene um, and just to continue having that community energy around. So um, sort of working from the right of this photo is the Depot Square area. Um, 
the very right of this area is the Depot Square. And that's where a lot of the sort of pizza, coffee, burgers, you can find that there. Um, that's also the pharmacy. So a lot of people park around it really quickly, go to the pharmacy and head out. Um, but as you move to the left or to the west, um, that is a, a retirement community. And as you see, there's a railroad crossing um, and not a short distance between the two. Uh, but we really felt that it was important to be able to move people from um, a large sort of parking area, like Depot Square has a pretty good amount of parking, um, to the recreation asset of Dog River Park, which is over where it says one on the photo. Um, so using a combination of sharrows, so those, those bike arrows that are on the road, as well as sidewalks, um, bump outs, and some other uh, pedestrian infrastructure, really strengthening that connection between Depot Square and Dog River Park and allowing people of all ages and abilities to get over to that asset, um, walking, biking, however they wish. Next. Um, this is just a sort of profile view of our plan view, cross section view. <laughs> There we go, um, of, of Wall Street. So it shows that uh, sidewalk outside of the right of way, as well as a nice little grass buffer with some lighting. There's also some sort of passive recreation spaces um, that we could also implement. Next. Um, yeah, so this is in the Northfield Center, sort of Norwich University area. And this is highlighting the Shaw Center, which, as you can see in the middle of the photo, um, is really the uh, trailhead for this large trail system that connects into the town forest trails. So they are two technically separate trail systems, but they are connected. Um, so if you're trying to access the town forest, you may park at the Shaw Center, go up the trails, and then find your way onto the town forest. Um, so as you can see, those three sort of existing trail heads have very different levels of amenities and formalities to them. The Shaw Center is really the only one that has a trail map and that as of a year ago was, was only a trail map for the Shaw Center trails and it had sort of been in the sun and weathered and it was very hard to read. Um, and then the other two trail access points um, are sort of that photo that we saw earlier where the road ends, the trail begins. You're not really allowed to park there in most cases. And um, if you are, there's very limited parking. Uh, no signs whatsoever. So this, these improvements and recommendations included both a way to get the students from Norwich University over to the Shaw Center, which is owned by Norwich, um, as well as to get people from just north of this uh, out of frame is the Depot Square area I was talking about earlier. So there's already a lot of sort of energy in that space and to get them through both sidewalks, that orange line is an advisory bike shoulder um, over to the Shaw Center. So sort of strengthening those access points that you would not need a car to use safely. Next slide. And finally, this is something that Northfield has a long, long history of research on. I think back in 05 was their first off-road path feasibility study. Um, and due to sort of uh, property owner constraints, the on-road improvements were prioritized. But as we, as we saw earlier, um, Route 12 just has constraints after constraints. It's narrow. Uh, people move quickly on it. There, uh, there is some sort of steep embankments on the side of much of the road that makes putting really anything um, quite expensive. And it's about a little over a mile um, to Northfield Falls from the village center area. It's like 1.7 or something like that. Um, so it's it's quite a ways to walk if you are going to walk, um, and also an expensive sidewalk if you're going to connect the two. So 
what we talked about was this off-road path sort of reconfiguring um, potential alignments as you see in the brown off to the right um, i'll talk through this image it's a little there's a lot going on um, but you see there's sort of the one long corridor that goes up from northfield center to northfield falls is the main off-road path so that um, uses both existing trailhead and proposed trailhead infrastructure to start um, moving across the slope um, up to Northfield Falls. The, there are a couple of potential ideas where it can split off and go to a residential community. It um, also right at the north terminus um, ends at a community playground and ball field space, as well as that's quite close to get to the post office and grocery store that we were talking about earlier. Um, the red dotted line is one of our steering committee members went out and attempted to ground truth some of the um, hypothetical alignments that we had come up with. So she did a really great job bushwhacking and finding, you know, this might not be the best alignment, but we could try over here. So um, that just goes to show there is just so much fantastic community energy around really making sure that whatever we do is done right. Um, especially when it comes uh, with private landowners potentially allowing access on their land. Um, so yeah, this was sort of a comprehensive system of off-road path that allowed people to um, get to their residential areas, get to the service center, as well as get to things, essential services such as grocery stores, um, that post office would make that list, and um, the pharmacy as well. So. Uh, yeah, that is this one. Then Sean, you can talk a little bit about the implementation matrix and sort of our next steps of the project. Oh, you're muted. Thank you. So, uh, you know, many opportunities were identified for improvements and, um, you know, through, through all areas of Northfield. Um, and so, uh, you know, as part of it, um, put together a uh, an implementation matrix, which I believe had over 70 entries, and uh, were grouped according to location um, and uh, and theme, um, as well as uh, you know the timeline for it, short. Um, um, uh, to long term, and uh, some order of magnitude cost construct uh, cost estimate um, with uh, you know some resources of of how those were were put together. Um, you know whether or not these projects would be within either state or um, uh, or municipal right of way, um, potential uh, funding sources, and um, and uh, steps for implementation. And so a lot of these you know individual um, opportunities were grouped together um, that would, you know, into groups that would make sense for separate scoping studies, um, you know, according to where they're located and, you know, how they're related to each other. And so they're kind of broken out so that then, um, you know, uh, they can be um, pursued as separate uh, as separate scoping studies. Um, once you know uh, scoping studies are completed, then um, uh, conceptual engineering plans can be prepared. The cost estimates can be refined, and that can be used to pursue funding um, for final engineering and construction. And once that funding is in place, then um, a final engineering can be completed and, and construction uh, commenced um, for uh, you know for some of these projects. And this is one where the implementation matrix included some of those transportation types of things like you're just saying that would require a scoping study as well as some of the trail connection and maybe some more of the recreation oriented funding sources right and so this is one where you might the community got back a matrix that had some of both of those types of projects in it is that is that right? 
That's right. Yeah. You know, and it really gives a great resource for the community to, to move forward with, you know, and, um, you know, identifying, hey, what are some of the lower hanging fruits? Um, what are some areas that um, are higher priority? Um, how to leverage some of the existing infrastructure to make um, some of those key connections, you know, um, where to make, you know, get the, the most for the funding, the most for the opportunity um, and, you know, uh, give give the um the community something that you know they can actually take and and um and use to pursue you know um projects at at different levels and i think is it going uh to lydia hi um lydia petty here i'm a uh, community advocate and kind of accidental walkability fanatic now. Um, I didn't know what I was doing when I moved to Northfield and ended up in a house that happened to be abutting the town forest. Um, so I'm a trail runner and now I'm I'm hooked on being able to like go out for a trail run and then run by the coffee shop and pick up my coffee CSA and you know drop something at the library and swing by the post office and get home and for my kids also to be able to do that. So, you know, this topic is like exactly where my mind is at. And I think our project, Ridge and River Routes, was really exactly like we wanted to mesh our transportation network with our recreation assets. Um, and we were really confused as a community group of lay people, like, why can't we just blend recreation and transportation? And when you're dealing with professionals who are like, you no, it's this or this, or you have to go at this grant or that grant. Um, so I'm really happy. I'm so glad we got to work with SE and Stantec and um, that we got a Better Connections grant and we were able to work towards starting to blend these things together in our community. Um, in this photo, you can see we were able to access a um, Vermont Department of Health Quick Build grant that was mentioned earlier um, in one of the other projects. And we were able to immediately get in some amazing benches and bike racks, which were missing amenities, um, and really show the community that we're not just doing planning, endless talking and creating documents. Like we're actually doing something that you can see and you can use. And uh, we got to work with Flywheel Industrial Arts. So these are you know, like custom products um, that are just, you know, gonna feel personal and um, uh, natural in our community. Um, it's really interesting being partnered today with uh, Kingdom Trails and the Rail Trail because those are our systems where the communities have embraced recreational tourism and, you know, are inviting people into their spaces. And working with Northfield is kind of interesting because at least some elements of our community are, um, you know, tourist phobic even. Um, and and so kind of trying to navigate the the people in our community who would prefer not to create infrastructure that would invite more people versus, and so so a lot of our focus has been on livability, um, really trying to create a community that's healthy, uh, equitable, making sure that access is available for different types of users and ability levels, um, wanting to be able to provide like the school students with an off-road path so they could actually get to the parks or to school. Um, so, so really, really looking at those things. We have already been able to acquire a Better Places placemaking grant for $18,000 to enhance our common area um, through COVID. A lot of the restaurants did not have any outdoor dining areas. So we're investing in movable seating, um, lighting, um, more benches and a game table to try to invite people out into the public space to like stay for a while, eat, play, um, we're also doing a community banner pod project where people, the high school students are painting banners with public spaces in Northfield and we'll be hanging those around the common. Um, so we're always trying to bring that like community spirit and art into everything we're doing. Um, we were also were able to um, access a regional planning commission scoping study to investigate um, some of these parking issues that we have. Um, and so we're going to be looking at various parking access and just access in general to the town forest because depending on what the community will tolerate we may end up um, needing to have parking further away and then have people walking so it might be a combination of, of pedestrian enhancements and parking um, i know we're running out of time so i will um, 
sign off for now and uh, let send it back to Jonathan, I'm guessing. Thank you so much, uh, Aiden and Sean and Lee, especially that was a really great way to wrap that one up. Um, and I think it, it speaks to the ability for this kind of process to spark a lot of you know community vitality generally, um, which is which is really I think a big part of what we need right now in our in our Vermont towns. Just out of curiosity, has um, has the advisory lane been uh, implemented or discussed any further? Which advisory lane? Uh, the one along um, Center Street. Oh yes, you know that one. The residents are—they're saying they want speed bumps and and police enforcement. <laughs> but we also have a grant out for um, an advisory lane on on Wall Street, and that one because there's fewer residences, we're hoping that we could do that on Wall Street and then show them, hey, this is really cool uh, to to have a temporary painted lane with delineators um, that's accessible for bikes and pedestrians and that senior center that's there in the senior housing. Awesome. Yeah, I think I think the advisory lanes are um, something that a lot of communities don't know about. I think it's still experimental from the FHWA technically, but I think it's a great potential like low cost solution for these roadways that like, you know, it's it's not realistic to expect them to be widened. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe maybe potential use for local motions pop up trailer to give that a try on a on a really temporary basis. We've got a uh, advisory lane in Burlington, so come try one before you buy it if you if you're in a town thinking about one. That's right. Yeah. Great. All right, let let's wrap it up. Thank you so much to to all of our panelists today um, and to everyone who came. Um, Feel free to send any comments or feedback my way. It's jonathan at localmotion.org. Um, and be on the lookout for an email tomorrow that'll include a link to the recording of this session, as well as um, some resources, links to grants, uh, links to the projects that were discussed, um, and then some, some local motion resources as well. Have a great day, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thanks for joining, it was so fun.